Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do, um, I'm starting with this idea that uh, tolerance and so forth, they're central to the practices of psychotherapy and they're central to the equality discourses. So what happens when these two uh, intersect in statutory settings like this one? Well, the first thing is, what, what, what are these issues in the first place? What are the problems? Um, um, what are the problems that require tolerating, accepting, and respecting in the first place? And how do the various schools of psychotherapy think about them? Well, these problems go by many names. Oppression, unfair discrimination, marginalization, racism, so forth. So in, uh, in this talk, I'm going to primarily speak of racism and use it as a shorthand for this sort of melange of processes, even whilst I recognize that the dynamics and issues are not the same in all of them. So how and why do these phenomena arise, phenomena arise in the first place? Well, in the 1960s and 70s, multiculturalism used the language of prejudice and thought that prejudice was born of ignorance. It was presumed that we naturally feared uh, those we knew little about. And so their solution was familiarization, education, if you will. And the belief was that as we became familiar with them, we'd be uh, less prone to treating them badly. We would tolerate their differences. That's the adage, different but equal. Psychological explanations, meanwhile, think that the sources of the problem lie in the psyche of individuals. And at the broadest of levels, there are three different uh, explanations, each with their own philosophy. There are the instinctivists, there are the developmentalists, and there are the cognitivists. For the instinctivists, they follow Hobbes. And they have the view that humans are born bad, born with uh, aggressive and hateful instincts, but also nurturing ones. However, according to them, in early life, it is the hateful instincts that are most strong. So we are born bad, uh, nature, raw and tooth and claw and so on. So in this view, racism and other social phenomena arise because of the conflicts going on in the psyche. And that's why this is characterized as a conflict model. And the developmentalists, meanwhile, are more with the philosopher Rousseau. And they th think that we are born good and made bad by life experiences. And this is the growth model. According to this view, if you have suffered a violent authoritarian upbringing, then you are more likely to grow up into a violent authoritarian individual. The cognitivists conceive of the difficulties of human life in primarily rationalist terms. They think that they are due to habituated errors of thinking, which when understood, free oneself to feel and think differently. But what is common to all these three strands is that not only are they apolitical, they are also individualistic, internalist and asocial. Let me elaborate what I mean. <coughs> In each case, social phenomena like racism, sexism and so forth are thought to be the effects and symptoms of problems residing in the internal world of individuals. If this is indeed the case, then it would make sense to treat the problem in that place, the psyche of individuals. To this end, the instinctivist focus on internal psychological mechanisms. The developmentalist intention is to understand the person's particular history. And the cognitivists use rationalist logic to correct category mistakes and other errors of thinking. But racism and the like are social phenomena. By social, what I mean is that large groups of people, sometimes whole societies, can come to hold negative perceptions of other groups and other societies, and most importantly, come to treat them badly in disparaging and dismissing, dismissive ways on this basis. Now, the only way these individualistic schemas can explain this kind of um, social phenomena is to suggest that the malfunctions in the psyches of individuals come to be closely synchronized in some sort of way. In other words, that social phenomena are made out to be a compound 
arising out of the addition of large numbers of individual processes. For example, take the theory of projection. This says that when I have some internal difficulty, say anger, which I can't deal with for some reason, this is repressed and projected into some other being. Now I come to experience this other being as angry, and I feel frightened of them. Now this theory does work, but it works at the level of a particular individual and a particular story. Um, but why, for example, project into black people rather than butchers? And, well, when we ask this sort of a question, the answer given is that, that we project into groupings that have already been socially sanctioned as deserving of those groupings. Well, that's right. But the question is, well, the answer actually misses the main point, which is how does that grouping come to be so socially sanctioned in the first place? Um, and, and how is it that these categories can suddenly shift and change from Jews to blacks to women to asylum seekers and so on? But mostly, psychology and psychotherapy of all persuasions do not trouble themselves much with these sorts of social issues. Their focus, their domain, is the mind of the individual. Individualism is an ideology. And like all ideologies, it masquerades as something factual and natural. In this way, it manages to obscure the workings of vested power relations. This is why Margaret Thatcher and the elites more generally advocate for it. The ideology of individualism also appeals to the ethos of new public management, the bureaucratic mindset that is currently blighting our public sector institutions. To this individualistic way of thinking, if bad things happen, then the blame lies with a particular individual or group of individuals. This is the bad apple theory. Having located the bad apple, there are now three possible courses of action. The multiculturalists would educate the bad apple, the psychologists would treat the bad apple, and others might just say, let us just punish them and get rid of them. Well, in the 1970s and 80s, the anti-racist movement disagreed with these strategies. They argued that rather than putting racists and oppressors through treatments or putting energy into educating them, the focus should be on challenging and changing the power structures of society. And their militancy did bring about many changes. But they lived in a polarised, two black and white world. For example, they conceded that all people were capable of being prejudiced. However, they said that only whites could be prejudiced because of this formula, that racism equals power plus prejudice. So to this way of thinking, um, only whites had power and blacks did not. Therefore, blacks could never be racist. And I was interested to hear that in the last months, the same defense has been rekindled by the diversity officer of Goldsmiths College, who used similar grounds to claim that she could not be racist towards white men. Well, the small victories of the anti-racists and the feminists encouraged other marginalized groups to try to improve their circumstances. This is where the diversity movement comes in. It claims to speak for all differences. And its innovation is to claim that differences can be reframed from problems to assets, assets to be welcomed and celebrated. So according to diversity theology, a more egalitarian society does not require the report the, a redistribution of resources. It echoes neoliberalist mythology to claim that if its doctrine were embraced, then the cake itself would get bigger and everyone, including the already well-to-do, would get more. It is primarily on this basis that diversity has been taken up by profit-making organisations. Diversity is sold to the boardroom on the basis that they will do well, in other words, make money, 
and it is sold to the public on the basis that it is doing good, of inclusivity, of acceptance, and so forth. But worryingly, as I will argue, not only does the rhetoric about inclusivity come to serve as a cover for the profit motive, at times it becomes utilised as an instrument of fear and control. You must appreciate and accept the ways of others, else you are being oppressive. Well, so far I've been speaking about movements and disciplines. Let me turn now to the street, the lived reality, where things were becoming increasingly turbulent. The violence and intensity of the Brixton riots in 1981 shocked the establishment. The view on the street was that the, the riots were provoked by aggressive and racist policing methods. Lord Scarman disagreed with them. He took the view that the cause of the riots was social deprivation. He did allow for some racism, but only of the individualised bad apple variety. He says, racial prejudice does manifest itself occasionally in the behaviour of a few officers on the street. About 10 years later, 1993, the horrific murder of Stephen Lawrence and the McPherson report that followed it changed all that. In contrast to Scarman, McPherson not only found the police guilty of wrongdoing, he also charged them with being institutionally racist. He declared that the issues were not individuals, but systemic. And this shift from individual to system was critical and was instated in the amendment uh, to the Race Relations Act in 2000. And it's important to understand the, what uh, this shift is. The, uh, the previous re uh, legislation proceeded on the premise that on the whole, um, organisations, people and um, the structures of society, on the whole, they were generally fair for all its inhabitants. And so one only had to look out for instances of wrongdoing. In contrast, the new legislation begins with the premise that structures and policies are already skewed in ways that favour some groups of people over other groups of people. Institutions, therefore, are obliged to begin with the premise that their ways are already unfair. So henceforth, organisations were required by law to be proactive in searching out these unfair dynamics uh, and to amend them. They had to produce, they had to do things to uh, reduce this possibility and they had to produce evidence to demonstrate that they had complied with their duties and were reducing existing inequalities. Well, what form does this um, objective evidence take? Well, bureaucrats, policy makers, academics and managers have all come to suffer from something akin to what has been called physics envy. This has resulted in the fetish fetishization of measurement. This has given rise to the peculiar belief that the methods of empirical positivist science that have been so spectacularly successful in the study of the inanimate universe are also applicable to the study of sentient self-reflexive Kantian beings called humans and their institutions. All kinds of peculiarities are decreed to be substantial by the device of allocating them a number. The appearance of a number creates the illusion that we are in the realm of objectivity. These pseudo numbers get bundled together using the rationales that in my view are closer to numerology than mathematics to produce pseudo results and scores which go by many names, such as performance indicators. It becomes crucial for institutions to measure up to the required score on these indicators because when they, are, when they don't, they're deemed to have failed and are penalised. I mention this because performance indicators will end up playing a role in the story of racism, to which I now return. <coughs> Racism is institutionalised in the structures, conventions and procedures of organisations. 
even yours. But racism is also institutionalized in the psyches of individuals who compose that organization. It follows then that we will find ourselves perpetuating this mentality to some degree despite ourselves. And I include myself in this. This then is the dilemma. As soon as there is an opportunity to use one's discretion, one will unconsciously do so in ways that are patterned by the ideologies that we are constituted by. However dispassionate and objective we think we might be being, our opinions and judgments are always going to be skewed to some degree. Well, this point was noted in the submission of the 1990 Trust to the McPherson Inquiry. And they said this. They said, racism can be detected in how existing policy is ignored or individual officers' discretion results in racist outcomes. Well, following the murder of Stephen Lawrence, both police forces uh, were adamant <coughs> that the murder was not a racist incident. This sort of get-out claim is always available as an alternative explanation. The fact that he or she has not progressed as fast as their colleagues is not due to racism or sexism, but simply because they're not very talented. No racism, no sexism, no problem. McPherson's solution was to create procedures that allowed the police no discretion in the decision as to whether or not an incident was racist. <coughs> and they say this, <clears throat> a racist incident is any incident which is perceived to be racist by the victim or any other person. Notice the powerful terms, perceived and any other person. Now, as soon as someone, anyone, perceives an incident to be racist, certain protocols are automatically triggered. Now, procedures seek not only to limit the range of options available to the decision-making process, they also intend to drive the individual to making the right decision. And when one looks at the debacle of the investigation into Stephen Lawrence's murder, one can understand why McPherson has proceeded in this way in each and every opportunity afforded to the police to discern between the possibility that the murder was racist or not, they chose the option that effectively colluded with the murderers. With each opportunity to use their discretion, they decided on conclusions that denied the existence of any racist, racist motivations in themselves or the horror itself. It is when faced with situations of this kind that the rationale for proceduralizing decision, decision making becomes understandable. But it is also how and why thinking is became, becoming increasingly replaced with flowchart following in organizational life. Of course, this kind of procedure is always potentially open to abuse. Guileful or disgruntled employees can always trigger grievance procedures by playing the race, sex, harassment or bullying card. But this cost has to be set against the prior situation in which self-serving discretion has allowed many an abuse to be swept under the carpet. So next, I want to look at how organisations set about complying with the law. But before then, I want to look at a couple of aspects of the law itself. And I'm going to uh, talk here about the uh, Race Relations uh, Act. Well, given that the Race Relations Acts are supposedly about how the races, the races, should and should not relate to each other, race relations, it's astonishing to note that the Acts have assiduously avoided naming the races, any of them, or even trying to define it. They have not done so, of course, because they cannot. And they cannot because there, is no, there are no objective entities called the races. So this is what the Race Relations Act does. It begins by saying that it is unlawful for a person 
to discriminate against another on racial grounds. And then it says, racial grounds are uh, defined as one of five categories, race, color, nationality, ethnic or national origins. So it is in this way that the notion of race has been smuggled into the legislature, unburdened by definition. So, okay, here it is in law. But now, in order to utilize the protection afforded by this very powerful act, um, a complainant has to establish that first, they do indeed belong to a racial group. So, as we'll, you probably will all know, that in 1983, a Sikh family called the Mandalas um, filed a case of race discrimination. They lost their case because the law courts thought that the Sikhs were not a racial group. It were a back and forth through appeals and so forth, it ends up with the law lords who decide that uh, they could be thought of as a racial group by virtue of their ethnicity. And they defined ethnicity in this way. Having a long shared distinctive history and a distinctive cultural tradition, further common char characteristics included a common geographical origin, common language and religion, common literature, and being a minority within a larger society. But notice the confusion of categories. The Sikhs, a religious group, are being considered to be a racial group by virtue of their ethnicity. So through other similar court cases, it came to be established in British law that Jews, Romani Gypsies, Irish travelers, and Afro-Caribbeans are also races, but not Hindus, Muslims, or Christians. And when the Rastafarians tried to join this elite squad on the same basis as the Mandalas, uh, were not wanting to cut out his hair, the law lords declared that the Rastafarians sorry, that the Rastafarians did not fall within the meaning of racial group, for their shared history is only of some 60 years duration, compared with that of gypsies, whose history is of only 700 years duration. Moral of the story, if you hang around long enough, you'll turn into a race. <laughs> the fact that the law is written in this way actually encourages the further racialization of society by requiring people to th think of themselves and others in racial categories. The problem is then uh, compounded further in the following way. Institutions are legally obliged to provide statistics about different sorts of groupings that work for the organizations, that it helps, and so on. And the virtue about hard data is that it helps generate objective knowledge. However, objective knowledge about race is not possible because race is not an objective category. So what do we do instead? We collect data on something called ethnicity. And the virtue about ethnicity, the Department of Health uh, and Social Care tell us, is that ethnicity is subjective. Well, being subjective, there is nothing to be proved. While other people, this is also from the, the advice, while other people may view an individual as having a distinct <coughs> ethnic identity, the individual's view of their own identity takes priority. My ethnicity is what I say it is. Well, everyone, including you, I'm sure, who comes into contact with institutions are asked to fill in an ethnic monitoring form that looks something like this. And uh, uh, just note the, um, the last thing. There's a, the, the thing on the bottom saying not stated, and that usually does not appear on these forms. I'll come to that a, a little later. Well, what a strange mishmash of categories two colours, a continent, a nation, and most disturbing of all, the idea of people who are allegedly mixed. By countenancing a notion of mixed as one of the categories of ethnicity, the legislature is giving succour to the racist as it implies that there exist categories that are unmixed or pure. We have to ask, where in this world has there ever existed a pure ethnicity? And the same questions have to be asked of the categories race and heritage. If you uh, have joined the Labour Party in the last uh, weeks, you will be uh, you will have asked you will have come across uh, this form, and on this form is the more troubling notion of mixed race. 
Now, the thing is, that self-ascription, although it has its own validity, actually misses the point completely. Racism, sexism, prejudice and the like are not driven so much by what I take myself to be, but what you take me to be, particularly if you are more powerful than me. In regards to racism, it is the more powerful person's subjectivity that comes to prevail. It matters little if a person thinks of themselves as Cambridge graduate, lawyer, middle class and so forth, if they are perceived first and foremost by the more powerful as Jew, Arab, black or woman, and this is the point, treated on that basis. It is also the case that ethnicity, the sense of belonging, is not fixed but context dependent. I, for example, am able to legitimately locate myself in the any other category of all five sections. Um, um, and and uh, another little story. Um, a young woman who belonged to the Italian community that has lived in uh, Scotland for many generations, she was asked uh, on a TV program, does she experience herself as Italian or Scottish? Her answer is, well, when I'm in Scotland, I think, feel myself to be Italian, and when I'm in Italy, I experience myself as Scottish. So, um, and, and in, in, um, in other critical ways, the ethnic monitoring form actually comes to bolster the processes of racism because it dooms certain kinds of persons to eternal otherness. For example, imagine a person called Jayanti, and whose uh, progenitors came to this country um, and, she, and have been here for several generations. And say she thinks of herself as British. Then on this form she has just three possibilities. White British, Asian British, or Black British. And she's unable to avail herself of the first of these, then she's manacled forever to the other two categories, black British or Asian British, and so remains eternally in the antechamber, never quite really British. I'm not, by the way, suggesting that such persons ought to experience themselves as simply British. I'm saying that if they did, the questionnaire gives them no possibility of claiming this identity. In this way, this ethnic monitoring form pushes people further into racializing themselves as well as others. In the current situation, it becomes imperative to be known and recognized by the legislature as a certain kind of people. This is because once a category comes to be officially recognized as such, then not only does it gain a legitimacy in public discourse, but now, as an entity, it is also deemed to have certain rights in relation to other similar entities. Quite literally, you are only counted, and therefore you only count when you are a certain kind of human being. So let me come now to um, this other point um, on the ethnic monitoring form. This last option not stated, and it's not there. And it's not there because there is no legal requirement for people to answer this ethnic question. <coughs> However, those filling out the form never get to see this because the Department of Health advises it is advisable, not advisable to give patients, service users and staff the opportunity to record not stated on the forms. And the Commission for Racial Equality echoes this saying, we recommend you do not say anything in your explanation that might encourage people not to answer it. For example, do not say this question is entirely voluntary. Why? because the number of answers collected has a direct bearing on the organization's data quality indicator. As the guidelines for the Department of Health, Health helpfully tells us, high proportions of not stated codes have an adverse effect on the overall DQI and hence on the organization's overall performance, performance indicators. What we are witnessing here is the needs of the organization trumping the rights of individuals it is supposed to be serving. In proceeding in this way, 
The performance indicator is literally about performance rather than performing. And the performance more in the service of seem to do good rather than actually doing good. Data is always suspect and always to be suspected. We know that, that academic researchers, bureaucrats, have become dexterous in the dark arts of manipulating situations and spinning statistics to sing the song they wanted to sing. For example, following 9-11 and 7-11, the British government introduced a series of counter-terrorism measures, specifically the infamous Section 44. Consequently, <coughs> police were no longer obliged to have explicit grounds for stopping and searching anyone on the street. In 2007, it became clear, in the absence of these sorts of checks, that black and Asian people were being disproportionately targeted by the police. In other words, the data revealed that the police were practicing a form of unfair discrimination and so were in danger of falling foul of the Race Relations Acts. But the police's way of dealing with the situation was not to reduce the frequency of stopping and searching the dark folk in the street, but to increase the number of white folk they stopped and searched. By this means, they cooked and balanced their statistical books. Thousands of white people are being stopped and searched by the police under the counter-terrorism counter powers, simply to provide a racial balance in official statistics. The latest figures show that there are 73,000 uh, were white, 20,000 were white, and 15,000 black. Lord Carlyle was perturbed by the fact, um, he's, he's the, uh, the watchdog, that if 50 blonde women are stopped who fall nowhere near any intelligence-led terrorism profile, it's a gross invasion of the civil liberties of those 50 blonde women. Lord Carlyle would appear to be less troubled by the similar invasion of civil liberties of hundreds of thousands of darker non-blonde folk because obviously they must all fall within the intelligence-led terrorism profile. Another case of they all look the same. <coughs> Moving back to organisations. The Race Relations Act placed obligations on institutions such as yours to put resources into ensuring that the culture of the institution is, is inclusive and so forth. One of the ways that institutions comply with this is by putting their employees through mandatory computerised trainings in equality and diversity. I'm sure you all have to do them. The rationale behind these trainings is the multiculturalist one. And uh, this is from the introduction to the one in Devon um, by um, the chair of the Commission of Racial Equality. And so uh, essentially it's where we lack knowledge on, about cultural differences and so forth. And um, they're the people we feel most frightened of. Um, at the conclusion of the training, the employee is tested. But they are reassured, if you don't pass on the first attempt, don't worry, you can have another go. A colleague tells me that a member of the team she worked for kept failing this test because in her view, gypsies and travellers were not a distinct ethnicity. Whether one agrees with her or not is not the point. She did not think this because she was stupid and that she did not understand her, the arguments. She arrived at a different conclusion. But she will only pass this test when her thinking conforms to the party line. What has happened to the ideal of respecting all differences? The pious claim found in this training that the intention of the training is not to instill <laughs> political correctness or tell people what to think is plainly not true. There will be considerable pressure on her from her bosses to press the correct answer because if she does not, the computer will deem her to have failed and this in turn will have a detrimental impact on the organisation's performance score. If and when she does eventually comply, it will be out of exhaustion. <laughs> As will be familiar to you, these sorts of trainings 
consists of infantile information like this. It is advisable, and this is out of the e-training, Devon training, it is advisable to ask people's first names. Joe, you didn't. <laughs> to check how or she wishes to be addressed. Joe, you didn't. <laughs> and so forth. And um, the test consists of questions like this. What is diversity? And you have tick boxes. The answer is number four, valuing difference rather than being afraid of it. <coughs> but if you are afraid of a particular difference for whatever reasons, as I am at times, and as you are bound to be, this kind of inane training is obviously not going to change that. Just telling me I should value it does not help. <coughs> this surely is obvious to everyone. So why are almost all statutory organizations insistent that all their employees should spend untold hours doing these tokenistic trainings. To my mind, this has to do with the defensive mentality of bureaucracies in general. Having put their employees through these trainings, the institutions are deemed to have done, is deemed to have done its duty and complied with the law. A box has been ticked. Now, if and when an employee were to act in some racist way, the institution can wash its hands claiming that it is not culpable as it has put its employees through the training. The difficulty is in the individual. The only way such trainings can be meaningful rather than tokenistic, and I would, I would not uh, like in that uh, sense and therefore to call it a training, you train dogs, uh, not people. Um, if, if it is to be meaningful, then it has to take place face to face in which case they will be much more expensive and time consuming. There will be argument and there will be tension. There will be anger and there will be fear. There will be hurt and there will be remorse. And most of all, there will be no neat agreement between the participants at the conclusion of the so-called training. <coughs> well, when um, diversity experts are not telling organizations how to make more money out of the marginalized. They are giving them lessons in sensitivity and etiquette, in how not to cause offense to others with a capital O. Clements and Spink say in their volume, The Equal Opportunities Handbook, by the time you have considered the issues in this book, you'll have developed greater sensitivity to what might be offensive. Their aim is to enable the reader to behave towards everyone with fairness, courtesy, and sensitivity. Their course is going to teach the reader a set of six transferable skills, empathy, understanding, race awareness, and so forth, a desire to be fair. Is that a skill? But these are not skills, these are moral attitudes. So in this way, the emotions and the and ethics are being instrumentalized. Well, they follow um, a mix of the multiculturalist and a kind of psychological ethos. And they think that prejudice is due to ignorance. But rather than uh, thinking about uh, getting knowledge about the other, they advocate uh, self-knowledge, looking in. And they say, we would encourage you to examine your beliefs, attitudes, and values regarding others who are different from you, to dig underneath layers of defense and justification built up over the years. This inner exploration, they claim, will lead to the more powerful becoming less prejudiced, and so they'll be um, more likely to encourage and promote others. This, of course, is a possibility. However, despite these trainings and models that have been going on for many decades, there has been very little change, as the diversity experts all agree. For example, an organization might put aside a room for the purposes of prayer by devout Muslims and their employing. In my view, this kind of cultural courtesy is no more than patronage by another name. It doesn't really change anything. If institutions were really serious about attending to the needs of marginalized employees, one of the simplest things that they could do, one of the things that make the biggest impact would be to provide a crash. And this is, it has to be said, as nothing exotic or mysterious about it. 
Well, a key ingredient in, in the training of uh, how not to cause offence is the use of language. And there is much that is sensible about it. For example, making it clear that sexist and racist abusive language is not acceptable in the work workplace. But there is another aspect that is not so sensible. For example, it is true that language is not just a passive means of apprehending a pre-existing reality, but that it critically informs, uh, in, act, it's critically active in forming and informing the way reality comes to be experienced. The way, the shorthand way it is usually put, is that language structures experience. I agree with this. But the next steps lead us into a conceptual morass. For example, in a well-regarded book aimed at the training of social workers, which is now into its fourth or fifth edition, the author Thompson notes that people belonging to the category the elderly are unfairly discriminated against. However, the issue for Thompson is the categorization process itself. He says, terms such as the elderly, the old, EMI, are commonly used, but nonetheless they are very dehumanizing. They depersonalize people to whom they refer. And he goes on to say, therefore, we should not use these terms which differentiate us from them. He says, we should avoid grouping people according to this, according to age, abandon the us-them mentality. His sequence is this. Categories create a them who are then marginalized. Therefore, we ought not to categorize. If we do not name them, then they won't exist as a special category, and so they cannot be marginalized. Well, we're being led into a 1984 land, trying to adjust reality by adjusting the words used to describe it. I agree that the elderly are often treated in shabby ways. They are the them to the mainstream us. But to then suggest that therefore one should not utilize the category is to my mind nonsensical. It seems obvious to me that the categorization of old people is useful precisely because they have very particular and specific needs that ought to be catered for. To treat the elderly and infirm like everyone else would be an exercise in negligence. Society ought to be discriminating in favour of them, um, uh, in favour of getting more of certain kinds of resources than the rest of us. Notice, or I notice, when I'm using the word us there, I'm locating myself not in the category of the elderly, but some of you <laughs> might think I do belong there. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> so, but, okay, so that's fine, that's for the elderly, we should not use it because we use the name, we differentiate them, and um, we discriminate against them. But when it comes to other categories, like black or Muslim, the game changes. We are told to do the exact opposite. We are told to respect and celebrate this category rather than remove it from the lexicon. And Thompson's rationale on this occasion is the diversity one. He says that we ought to emphasize the differences between individuals and across groups because such, such differences are best seen as assets to be valued. Well, why does the argument that apply to the elderly not apply equally to Jews, women, trans and black people? In my view, the, and, and it would look like this, by the way, from the same sentence, in my view, the reason behind this anomaly is the taken-for-granted belief that some groupings like the elderly are merely artifacts of ways of thinking, whilst other groups, like black and Muslim and so forth, are thought to have a real objective existence. How real is this? Well, multiculturalism advocates that people of different cultures should learn to tolerate each other. The thing is that just by the very use of the phrase English culture, I create an illusion of cohesion and uniformity. But when I look at any depth of so-called English culture, it disintegrates into a number of conflicting overlapping cultures and practices. Islam has its bloody feuds between Shia, Sunni and Wahhabi. The untouchables experience of Hindu culture is radically different from the Brahmin and so on. So I cannot simply 
accept and tolerate their culture because there are varieties of conflictual thems within the them. Here is the thing. Cultural practices and beliefs are, amongst other things, institutionalized rationales of domination and oppression. Cultural practices are sedimented power relations. They explain why it is only men that may become priests, why it is right and proper that the genitalia of women should be mutilated, why one kind of person is entitled to resources and another is not, and so on. Those who are beneficiaries of this way of think, uh, of, of the ways that a culture is structured, mostly conservative bearded men, use a version of culturalism to defend oppressive cultural practices on the grounds that they are our way. In the main, in almost all cultures, it is the women folk who mostly find themselves at the wrong end of things. This move finds favour with the diversity promulgators who also decouple politics from culture. It follows then that there is no such thing as the black community or the Muslim community in the singular. There are multiple communities, each with different interests and beliefs in conflict each with each other, each claiming to be the community. It is also the case that just because black people tend to be recipients of prejudice and racism, that does not make them a community. Like the category English, black people are bankers, bakers and criminals too. The convention would have it that it is the differences, race, culture and so on, that are the causes of hatreds and animosities. But consider, any two people are the same on, as each other on a range of categories. And in the same moment, they are different to each other on a range of other categories. And both are true at the same time. So in this moment, do you experience me as different to you? And if you do, what have you done to the similarities and why? Or do you experience me as the same as you? In which case, what have you done with the differences and why? It is not that there are no differences between persons. Rather, there are multiple differences between us, multiple similarities. And by amplifying and making meaningful one or other of them, we come to construe one kind of us and them. And if we amplified another, we would make another kind of us and them. In sum, what I'm arguing is that there is nothing intrinsically different about the difference that we think makes a difference. This is why I cannot simply respect their culture, because uh, in respecting one of them, or some of them, I'll be disrespecting another of them. Um, and whether I realize it or not, I somehow end up deciding what to tolerate or not, what to accept or not. In other words, tolerance is not the opposite of discrimination. Indiscriminate tolerance of the kind the diversity celebrators advocate is dangerous nonsense. But this decision as to what, uh, what feels right is not wholly conscious and sometimes is entirely unconscious. So it becomes clear that equal opportunity statements claiming the values of tolerance and acceptance of all things, whilst honourable in their intentions, are exemplars of something that George Herbert Mead calls cult values. Well, cults of, of small description, they hold unrealistic beliefs about themselves and the world. <coughs> Ours is the only way, this is the way the world is, and so forth. And Mead argues that many of our day-to-day -day unreflected beliefs are also cult values. And there are many such cult values in organisational life job specs and equal opportunity statements being two of them. When employees sign their contracts, they are tacitly agreeing to the codes of ethics and conducts of their organisation, which are stuffed full of cult values of these kinds. And whilst things are going well enough, there is a tacit agreement that no one will look too closely at what is actually happening. But when difficulties arise, then these fictions are made manifest and exploited for other ends. I'm going to speak more directly about tolerance. The equality movements tend to speak about tolerance in ways that make it seem akin to a form of benign acceptance. But the thing is about tolerance is that it is only required when there is a difficulty in accepting something. A non-smoker sharing a table with a friend who is a smoker 
is requiring to tolerate their discomfort. So tolerance is not a state of benign acceptance, but of ongoing discomfort and tension. The celebrators of diversity in the world have no need of the mechanism of tolerance because they have nothing to tolerate, having magically transformed differences into assets which they have then welcomed and celebrated. As a strapline, as of one uh, diversity consultancy puts it, value all sorts. But should I value? Should I value all sorts? What of the fundamentalist sorts that are not willing to accept my sort? If I do not accept them, am I being oppressive in some way? What if I think that one of the sorts is toxic to my well-being and the well-being of others? How do I know if my antipathy to this sort is grounded in ethics or in ignorant prejudice? And even if I think that this sort is antithetical to my ethical sensibility, is it nevertheless my ethical duty to try and tolerate and accept it? Well, procedures and protocols developed by bureaucrats are designed to rescue us from the burden of engaging with these difficult and intractable ethical tensions. They absolve us from the responsibility of working through them. The thing is that bureaucracies concern themselves mainly with compliance rather than ethics. Procedures are designed to comply with the legislature and employees are required to adhere to these procedures. Follow procedure and one can do no wrong. Disciplinaries, as you will know, mainly tend to find fault on grounds of compliance rather than ethics. Did you record the events of each meeting every day of the <coughs> protocol's decree? Is your language inclusive? It is in this way that I think equal opportunity protocols have to some degree been appropriated and put in the service of controlling the workforce through the evocation of fear, which results in a kind of paralysis. How far-fetched is this notion that emanci emancipatory ideals have been perverted and appropriated and um, put in the service of the panopticon? After all, Vision statements and equal opportunity statements are full of claims for fairness, inclusivity, and so on. Well, the ideals of the equality movement are exactly that, ideals, platonic ideals. They can never be realized in actuality. For example, inclusivity is not an absolute. Even as we include one thing, we necessarily exclude another, as I am doing continually as I speak in my uses of us and we. We are bound to fail to in our attempts to practice universal non-discrimination because without, without discrimination, we would be unable to think. In respecting one, I am inevitably disrespecting another. In this black and white world, faced with these platonic ideals, one has failed before one has even begun in a version of original sin. Because of this, one is inherently and eternally vulnerable to some accusation or another. The rosy glow given off by the rhetoric serves two insidious functions. For one thing, it comes to mask the processes of marginalization that continue to flourish. And second, the impossibility of measuring up to the rhetoric becomes a means of control. In this black and white world, it is always possible to accuse all and anyone at any time of falling short of these ideals. The thing is, not only are the individual employees caught up in this mythology, so are the institutions they work in, and it is this that makes them cult values. Organisational rhetoric emanating from HR departments often claim that not only are the goals readily achievable, but that they have already been achieved. The terrible thing is that even as the actual situation becomes harder and harder to speak about in any meaningful way, inequality and inequity continue to flourish in the midst of these confusions. Procedures and protocols that were primarily created with misdemeanors uh, in mind also come to be applied indiscriminately to those who are incompetent, to those who are irresponsible, as well as those who make errors of judgment to the lazy, indifferent, mechanistic, bureaucratic mindset, wrong is wrong. 
The reason why institutions act in these sort of draconian ways is that they too are afraid of being punished and penalised. When accused, their first defence tends to be, we cannot be accused of any wrongdoing because we have fully complied with the regulations. When this strategy fails, institutions often sacrifice their own, the bad apples, the innocent often being sacrificed along with the guilty. As I near my conclusion, I should say that I'm not against procedures and protocols. I recognise their necessity. What I am against is the use of procedure as mindless directive, as a means of replacing thinking with flowchart following. I touched on the psychological at the start of the paper, and although it might appear that I have not said anything more about it since then, this is not the case. Well, it might appear to be the case if one subscribes to a view of encapsulated individuals with psyches somehow residing outside and prior to the social. But if one follows Fuchs, Elias and others, then one cannot divorce psyche from society without rendering both meaningless. Politics and power struggles are integral to existence itself and so permeate and constitute not only cultures but psyches. Further, our ethical sensibility is critical and central to this mix and it is at the heart of what makes each of us a human being. The only way that I could ex embrace a difference that was antithetical uh, to my ethical sensibility, which the diversity celebrators would have me do by somehow reframing it as an asset. The only way I could do this would be to repress and, and cut off from my sense of right and wrong. If I did this, what would I have become? Would I still be me? Ought I to try to be relentlessly positive at all times towards all differences? I think not because to do so is to collapse the distinction between being deliberately offensive and causing offence, as well as the distinction between judgmentalism, which is moralistic, and judgment, which is both ethical and necessary. I also think that the aims of HR departments could do with being a bit more modest and not feed the myth that equality, heaven, is readily achievable, because these myths and absolutist claims lend themselves in being, to being used in the service of intimidation and control. And all these things, I think, work towards generating a thought and action paralysis. <coughs> it seems to me that many of the contradictions within the equality discourses are there because they are a reflection of the difficulties that exist at a fundamental level in contemporary ways of thinking about human beings in organizational life. At the heart of these difficulties is the capitalist belief that the human being is a commodity that is there to be manipulated and controlled, in tandem with the cognitivist belief that the human being is a machine-like entity who can be trained to think, feel and act in specific ways for specific ends. There is no clear, straightforward solution to the situation we find ourselves in, in regards to inequality. When things go awry, as they are bound to do, instead of resorting to the mindless operation of punitive procedure, something akin to the activity of ethical engagement is called for. This engagement is likely to be conflictual and unequal because, power, because of power relations and the offices held by the protagonists. The situation remains ever complex, and what we have to resist is the simplifications and relentless positivity being foisted on us by the celebrators of diversity. Thank you. We have time for